So yeah, we're going to go ahead and start. My name is Monica Anderson. I'm a supervising deputy attorney general with the AG's office. Um, my background in electronic discovery is has to do with some large class actions that the state of California defended in which we had to collect, produce, uh, privilege, not a, I don't even think a terabyte yet at that time, but hundreds of gigabytes of information um, for representing the state and the state agencies in litigation. Um, I have a special guest star with me today. If you didn't see him on your program, his name is Charles Penn, and he is the program manager for our law practice support section. In the AG's office, we are fortunate um, to have a law practice support section which helps us with many of the e-discovery issues that come up, contractors, um, processing information as it comes in, and things like that, working with our um, databases for storing the information that we have obtained. Um, and so uh, Charles is here with me today um, to talk about it. Charles is not a lawyer, um, and I am. So we are trying to bring two different perspectives to you this morning. Um, and so, Charles? So before we get started, um, a quick um, questions just so we know the audience. How many of you work for the public sector? So you work for the state. With the state. With the state. With the state. Okay, so everybody is with the public sector. We don't have anybody from the private sector. I'm private sector also. Oh, okay. So you're, you're a vendor? Um, we, have, we do all of the uh, um, processing for DHCS for, for Medi-Cal beneficiaries enrolling in through managed care services. Okay, so perfect. The, yeah. So now how many of you would consider yourself IT versus legal? IT? Okay, and legal. Terrence, how about you? Where do you fit in, sir? Uh, audit, so I do investigations in IT. Okay, perfect. And um, our goal is to have a blend of both because in this day and age, you really can't have one without the other, so we're stressing um, getting to know both sides, the legal and the IT. Ready? Yeah. Well, let's go. So our goal for the training um, is to talk a, lot, a little bit about electronic information. What is it? Um, we don't have a lot of time, so we're assuming that you know m many of the basics already. We were specifically asked to touch on, um, on the federal rules of civil procedure, how they impact ITs, IT staff, um, as well as talking about litigation holds, preservation requirements, and things like that. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to go rather quickly. If you have a question, we'd ask if you just jot it down on your notes there, and then um, we'll pick it up at the end. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, if you feel like you can't remember a question at the end or don't want to write it down, feel free to just throw your hand up. But otherwise, we'd ask if you could just um, hang on. Okay, some strategic e-discovery facts. Um, why is e-discovery so important now? And that is because 60% of all business data resides in or is attached to email. Um, the Tower Group estimates that 7.5 billion new office documents are generated annually and that um, as much as 90% of all business documents are unstructured information residing on individual hard drives and that ESI is requested in three out of four lawsuits involving Fortune 500 companies. And ESI is electronically stored information. So if you hear us use um, an, acronym, an acronym, acronym and have not uh, defined it, please let us know. Um, how is information stored? 90% of all information is stored electronically and as little as 3% of it is on paper, which is a huge shift as, from where we saw it um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It used to be that discovery was paper, boxes of paper. Now it's turning into hard drives, and that's why um, electronic discovery is becoming so important. Well, and it's also why it's such a big mess, because when you have so much information, if it's on a computer hard drive, it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, if you have a file cabinet and it starts to overflow, at some point you think, oh, I better clean that out, or most people. Um, and then, you know, until it's so big that you can't move around in your office anymore. But you, at some point, clean it out. As hard, as hard drives get bigger and bigger... And cheaper. And cheaper, right. People, they just stop throwing things away. They just keep it all on their hard drive. 
And for you as IT or lawyers, that means that you have to look at it. It might be non-responsive, it might be privileged, but you're still going to have to look at the information. So you want people to follow a document retention policy, a document retention slash destruction policy. You want them to throw things away too. And from an IC, IT point of view and from a manager's point of view, it is more cost effective to add hard drives than it is to coerce people to clean out their um, electronic um, files. Um, the amount of time that it takes for people to manage their unstructured data is, is huge, and it's just more cost effective to throw on another terabyte or two and not worry about it. And that is turning into a huge problem for attorneys. So what are we talking about here? What are the types of electronically stored information? Um, things that you think about every day, word processing documents, emails, email attachments, uh, spreadsheets, databases, instant messages, text messages are becoming more and more of an issue for um, organizations and companies. Audio files, voicemail messages, network logs, PowerPoint slideshows like this, graphics files and videos. And sometimes things like network logs are particularly relevant in a case because it'll tell you when someone was accessing information. Um, were they, you know, what were they looking at and when. So a lot of the, these are just, um, it's a quick short list for you to think about as you're looking at different types of places that ESI might be stored. And things that the IT people and the lawyers need to come together and strategize about. And the sources of all this information, it's not just, you know, the first bullet point there is what most of us think about when we're thinking about where is the information that we need to look for. We're thinking of desktop and laptops. And then we think about the network and email servers. But it goes much further than that, and it goes to cell phones, PDAs, Blackberries, smartphones, Kindles, iPads, uh, backup tapes, CDs, DVDs, thumb drives, off-site storage, home-based computers. If you allow your... Um, employees to telecommute and they are allowed to use their home computers and opposing counsel feels that they might have information relevant to this case now their home computers are uh, susceptible to discovery um, black boxes external hard drives and um, the internet and intranet de uh, data it's so easy now for employees to have an a Google Docs account. Oh, you know what? I'm going to work on this at home. I'm going to throw this up on Google Docs so I can get it later. So there's just huge, um, huge places um, to start thinking about. So um, when you're looking at different states of data, data can be maintained in various ways. And if you think about the states of data, how data is maintained, that, um, it says here, cheap to expensive. And that means for you to collect and look at or produce. So from a litigation perspective, here's what we're, this is why we rank them in this way. If, yes, so active data is the easiest to obtain and then legacy data is the most difficult and therefore most expensive. And the active data is just the active files, you know, anything that you can see in your Windows Explorer and drag and drop is active data. <coughs> And then it just progressively gets harder and harder and um, more costly to um, extract data and get it into a usable format for review and production. And one of the things that we'll talk about with respect to the rules, uh, the federal rules of civil procedure and their current requirements has to do with backup tapes and deleted and altered files. There's some significant cases we'll talk about later, but mainly Zubalake that defines um, the party's obligations with respect to backup tapes or inaccessible and accessible information. But when you get into, um, when you start looking at the states of data, is something maintained on a backup tape, which is simply disaster recovery, or is it, has it been deleted, and you, do you need to do some computer forensics restoration to get that back? that's going to start costing more money. And under the federal rules, as we'll get to in just a minute, the, that um, requires you to do an analysis of whether or not the, the information is readily accessible or if it's too burdensome to produce. So that's why you have to look at the states that the data is maintained. So now that we've talked about what data is, where it can be found, and the various devices, now we're going to go ahead and lead into the the legal aspect of how this now all comes into play when opposing counsel comes at you with a, a, a demand. 
So there's four main concepts in the new, and I say new, but really they've been around, they've been changed since 2006, so they're not so new anymore. Um, but the amended federal rules of civil procedure. Um, and some of those things include, you have to be considering electronically stored information, or ESI, at a very early stage in your litigation. There's a two-tiered approach to backup media, whether you have to produce that or not. Um, there's some practical adjustments to the rules to make them in line with electronically stored information, which they didn't, there didn't even be, used to be a definition of what electronically stored information was in the rules. There is now. And then also, one of my favorites, since I'm always producing large, volume, large volumes of information um, on behalf of a state agency, there is this provision that is a shallow safe harbor for e-document destruction, and we'll talk about that. And a lot of these, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these um, concepts also apply to AB5, which is California's um, electronic discovery um, statute. statute. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are just coming into the room, uh, let me mention, my name is Monica Anderson, and I work for the State of California Department of Justice. I do litigation and produce and and collect information in some of the larger class actions. I have a special guest star today, he's not on your program, and that's, his name is Charles Penn, and he's from our law practice support section, he's the manager there. He is my go-to IT guy. I never do anything on a case without him. Um, and for all of you out there who are lawyers, are, can I see a show of hands of who's the lawyers? Okay, so for all of you lawyers, the third Friday in July is IT day. So you want to know that and take your IT person out to lunch because it's key for you to have a really good working relationship with your IT people. So remember that date. You can Google it. There really is IT day, um, and you want to take advantage of that. All right, so we're talking about critical decisions come early. For those of you who are not lawyers, you might be wondering, why do I care about changes to the rules of the, of, uh, the, the federal rules of civil procedure? Well, you care because they impact the way that you have to do your job in, with respect to litigation. So the lawyers are required to do these things here. They have to talk about um, issues relating to preservation very early on. They have to talk about it really soon in the case. So when they start coming to you and asking you to preserve, this is why, because the rules require it. They also have to be able to talk about changes in the timing of production, the form of production, or initial disclosures. Now, changes in the timing is key because if someone comes to you with a terabyte of information, that's going to have to be collected, reviewed for privilege by a bunch of lawyers um, in your agency or someone from the AG's office perhaps, but then you have to also produce that. So the rules generally give you 30 days it's really difficult to produce, to gather, review, and produce a terabyte of information in 30 days. So if you have a lot of information, you should be thinking right up front about how you're going to change the timing of the production. I suggest a rolling production. That, always, that means that you produce, um, you start collecting, and as you get through information, you, you produce it as you go along. And it will take you longer, but then the other side will be happier because they're actually getting something that they can look at too. Um, you know, if they get dumped with a terabyte of information, it's going to be hard for them to look at it all at once anyway. So I you know, suggest a rolling production. Um, and then also the form or forms of production. We'll talk about that in a little bit. What is the full 26A? Is that a federal rule? That is a federal rule of civil procedure, 26A. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and actually 26 talks about discovery requirements. So if you look at that rule, um, and you can access, access it online, um, and if you look at that rule, it sets forth the requirements. It's pretty detailed. And so that's why the lawyers are, are hounding you about what um, what it is that they need and why they need it so quickly now. All right. So, IT and legal staff. Why do we want you, um, all the IT staff, to be as educated about this as the lawyers and to be able to work with the lawyers? Well, here's why. Some judges, including Judge Kramer in San Francisco, has what he, I lovingly refer to this as his one geek rule. He, he wants the lawyer to show up in court, and he wants their IT staff to come too. You get to pick one person, the other side does the same, and you can basically battle it out about how you're going to handle discovery. 
The federal rules of civil procedure now require you to do that. You have to you know, know about the other side's <laughs> IT um, requirements and, and what you want, and you have to go back and forth and have a meet and confer. But here they actually, you know, he requires you to go to court, decide what you're going to do, and it's all, it all gets you know, hammered out at the beginning. In uh, the Maryland Protocol, they have the, something that is similar. Again, you could Google that if you want, and it talks about the requirements for the parties when they're going to, what they have to do at a meet and confer. And it also calls for an e-discovery liaison, which for all of you IT people out there, that could be you. You could be your, your company's or your department's e-discovery liaison for a specific piece of litigation. In fact, I see some people out here, IT, who I have worked with before, um, specifically in cases where they're pretty much the e-discovery liaison. So, um, you were asking about Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 26, well, under B2B. Um, this is where the rules carve out this exception for information that's not readily accessible. Remember, we talked about the states of data and how easy it was to get certain things and the more difficult than the cost rose. So the rules specifically provide that if there is discovery of ESI from sources that is not reasonably accessible, then you don't have to produce it. Well, you get to object and say, I don't want to produce it. You still have to preserve it, so you can't start deleting, but then your lawyer can go to court and say, that this is too burdensome and we shouldn't have to produce it. And then the lawyers and the court are going to have to decide whether it is too burdensome or not. And in most circumstances, that means that you are going to have to be involved in explaining why it's not readily accessible. It could be because it's something that is on backup tapes, and backup tapes are mostly for disaster recovery. It could be because it's, on, it's legacy data, Many state agencies, they have you know, a person who was out there and they didn't have money um, to buy some newfangled system, so they created a database on their own and it worked great. And then they used it and then that person left. There's a lot of useful information in that database, but they're gone. Nobody else knows how to run it. So that's what we would consider a legacy system, one that's sort of old and outdated. And you know, Frank knew how to work it, but now nobody else really knows how to get information. But someone might want that. So you, as the IT staff, need to be able to uh, have these discussions about how accessible is whatever it is that they're asking for. And this is why, again, um, I can't stress enough the importance of building a relationship between legal and IT. And it's, it's not something it's not shaking the hand and introducing yourself. It's a very long process where you're educating each other on your fields of expertise so the attorney now knows when she or he goes to the meet and confer, um, opposing counsel spits something out, she immediately has an idea, it's now red alert, red alert, I remember talking about this with IT, that's not a good thing. And I know now when she comes back to me and says, okay, we've got a litigation hold, I now understand the implications and the seriousness of what's going on. It's not just, no, oh, it's another yapping attorney in my ear wanting to hold on to more data. Lawyers never do that. <laughs> I, I get it now, and so it's, it's a relationship that needs to be um, started and forged through years and years, and I, I just can't stress that enough. Okay. So we're talking about accessible and inaccessible. Yes. Oh. Well, an archive is different than um, a backup tape. So if you have a backup tape, that's simply um, something that's used for dis disaster recovery and your organization could be doing a, you know, a daily backup, a weekly backup, something like that. Um, and archiving something is different. You can archive your email. Like you can personally decide to archive your email. Um, but I'm not so sure. I'm wondering how frequently in court the backup tapes are used as a discovery source and how often that argument's working that it's not accessible when they don't have well, the argument's made all the time, and the, um, the accessibility of information on a backup tape really depends on the organization, the way the organization handles their retention destruction policy. Because if they're recycling their backup tapes every day and doing things um, on a quicker time frame, then it's more difficult for them to stop doing that. 
um, or if they have a monthly or weekly or something, we'll tell them, okay, pull, the, pull a monthly back up and still go through with your other um, recycling. But it really does depend. But the, back, the accessibility issue is huge. And so, it, but it's, what I've found is it's more of a case-by-case -case basis depending factually on what the organization does and what they, how they preserve. Um, yeah. The, the real difference between a backup and an archive is archive is data you choose to save and it, you may not have touched it for years but you, you still have it. A backup is, is a way to recover information that's been deleted. So the reason they would be going after backups is to get something that wasn't saved, not so much to get something that's been saved. Purposefully saved. Yeah. Right. Okay, and this is just, again, accessible versus inaccessible, and I think we've, we've beat that into the Covered ground. That? Okay. So um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, you have to, Rule 34, which talks about production of electronically stored information, requires that you discuss the form of production. How are you going to produce the documents that you have? Are you going to produce them in their native format? Are you going to produce them as a, a PDF? which a lot of people do, but if you have a PDF, it may or may not be searchable. And searchability is one of the things that lawyers have to have in able to determine whether something is responsive or not. If you give me a stack of PDF documents and I can't search it in a database without going to a lot of effort, it's like just giving me a box of papers that I have to sort through by hand. So you want to know how you're going to get the documents from your opponent, and you're going to have to know and understand why you would want to do certain things when you produce them. And you would also need to know your obligations when you go to produce um, and what you can and can't do at time of production. Yeah, there's a case, and it's um, called Graceland, and in which a court reordered a party to produce. They had to reproduce their documents because they had changed it from one format and and produced it in a format that decreased its searchability. So it made it more difficult for them to use it. Well, you can't do that. The court said, you already have it this way, what, and it isn't going to cost you a lot more to produce it this way, and yet you purposefully you know, gave them PDFs that they couldn't search. So go back and do it right. So that's an example of what will happen. And now, under, also under the, the rules, the demanding party, whoever's making the discovery request, gets to decide what format they want it in. You can object if you're producing. You can say, you know, that format's going to be too expensive to produce that way, or, you know, it's, it's, this is a better way. Um, but the demanding party gets to request the way that it is, is produced. And if they don't, then the default is the ordinary, the way it's kept in the ordinary course of business. So if they don't demand a certain way, then you have to produce it in the ordinary course of business. And that goes right in line with the Graceland case, which said that you can't degrade the searchability of something. Yes? Um, what about Word documents? One of the problems with Word is sometimes previous versions or even documents from uh, another person have ended up uh, hidden in a sense, but mm -hmm. you don't know how to get it. And yes. if there, what about scrubbing that data? Yeah, we, we don't really, we don't have a lot of time this morning to talk about the metadata issue, which is huge, and that is, you know, an hour discussion on its own about how do you preserve client confidences and by, by not producing metadata, inf you know, inadvertently producing confidential in, in information and metadata, which is what he's talking about. If you're going to produce a Word document, um, how do you do that without inadvertently producing client confidences? And... You can do that by saving it as a new document, giving it a whole new name, and that way you can't go back and look at track changes. So that's one way to do it. But, but I, I think this is, goes back to the discussion you and I have had before. But if you're producing, are you referring to giving a document to opposing counsel, like a pleading or a brief, mm -hmm. or are you referring to a production document? Yeah, that's a good distinction. If you're, if you're producing something in discovery, then you, if you want to preserve information, confidential information, such as prior drafts of a document or something that may be maintained in the metadata, you have to do what's referred to as a metadata scrub log. So you're doing a privilege log, but basically on confidential information in the metadata. Does everyone know what I'm talking about when I say metadata? Okay. So um, there is a difference between producing information and discovery um, versus 
just simply corresponding with another lawyer about your case. So in corresponding, absolutely, you can scrub the metadata and get rid of your track changes, but for discovery documents, do not alter them in any way, and that comes into a buzzword you'll see in another slide called spoilation, mm -hmm. which has huge ramifications for you and your side if you are found to be in violation and have um, even inadvertently done uh, conducted, I'm not using it the right sense, <laughs> spoilation. Yes. You don't want to throw things away. No. Um, so Rule 37E refers to this shallow safe harbor that I said. If you're the producing party, you love this because what this means is if your organization has been following its uh, destruction or retention slash destruction policy and documents are lost, you're not going to be subject to spoliation sanctions. If you are following your routine good faith destruction policy, then you're going to be covered by this part of the rule. Now, you, your lawyers, those of you who are the lawyers in here, you have an obligation to implement a litigation hold and make sure that that litigation hold is directed to the people who are going to implement it. So if your litigation counsel, like us at the Attorney General's office, we have to make sure that we communicate with staff counsel. Staff counsel then has to make sure that the IT people know that there's a litigation hold in place. So then that, the litigation um, hold can be implemented by the IT staff across email and local servers and things like that. Um, so there are triggers for what triggers the litigation hold. But this shallow safe harbor provision comes in to protect you uh, before a litigation hold um, should have been issued. So there's a, you know, a time when that is important, and you need to know that time as well. But here you have a little bit of a backup. And another key point, if you walk out with nothing else other than form a relationship between IT and legal, the second one is make sure that your organization has a document retention and destruction policy and that you are adhering to it. it a lot of um, organizations might have a document retention and discovery um, policy, and it's in a nice three-wing binder, and it's up here on the shelf, but they're not adhering to it or they're not making sure that it's being adhered to until they get slapped with the lawsuit and all of a sudden IT is coming and saying, oh, yeah, we, we got those on tape right back here. We just never bothered, you know degaussing them. That's all right here. It's now all discoverable. Even though you have a retention policy up here that says it should have been destroyed, if you're not adhering to it, you're in trouble. Yeah. So that's another key point. Yes. I have seen with a lot of agencies, there's no guideline provided by higher up for retention policy. I've been asking, I've been with the state agency for about three, four years, came from private sector. Nobody's willing to do that, is there any guidelines that can be provided at the higher level from you know, AG's office, something like mm -hmm. that we can present to our boss and say, hey, this is what we want to do, because try to tell, tell him, you know, folks, they don't, understand, they don't listen mm -hmm. until they're going to get stuck with some heavy sanctions, that's the only, oh, really? Yeah. And, well, and, and we get blamed on this uh, down the road, that's what I, I'm, I'm fearing about. Well, with respect to document retention um, slash destruction policies, the AG's office, we do go and train the state agencies and their general counsels in uh, document retention and destruction. I'm, I'm a big fan of the delete key. I said this earlier, delete, delete, delete. As long as there's a policy in place and you're following that policy, then don't, don't preserve information that you're no longer obligated to do. And, but enforcing that is the real issue. So as IT staff and as lawyers, you have you know, a, an affirmative obligation to go out and make sure that that is happening. Now, there are a lot of places that you can look for um, litigation holds and document retention slash destruction policies online. The American Records Management Association is one place. Um, the Sedona Conference, which we'll talk about later, has a lot of guidance, offers a lot of guidance too. Um, but there are places that you can look and, and make recommendations to your agency. You can also contact the AG's office um, for training in that. So we do do, do that. Are there any guidelines in SAM or SIM or anywhere to, for <coughs> retention? Um, I don't uh, usually, I don't really touch upon that because as, it depends on the business, the legitimate business need of the organization. 
So from a lawyer's perspective, as long as you have a, litig a legitimate business need, that's acceptable. There are some large organizations that you, you know, deal with every single day. They have like a, maybe a one-week retention for email. And how do they get away with that? Because they say, you know, you read it and you act upon it and then we get rid of it. So many state agencies, for example, retain email for 90 days and then it's off the server. But this organization keeps it for a week and you say, well, how can they get away with that? We've got their stuff in there that we might need. But if they can show that's their, their legitimate business need, then that's, that's acceptable. And as long as they're not doing it to try to circumvent some form of discovery, I mean, that would be sanctionable. But if they say, here's, here's what we need, and then we're going to do it. Um, to answer your question, though, Sam and Sam basically just say we have to have a policy. They don't have guidance on what the policy should be. So there's specific uh, guidelines for financial records, though? Yes, and there's, there are often statutes that govern retention requirements. I'm not talking about circumventing any statutes because there's, you, could, you could have a statutory obligation to preserve, and if you do, you need to follow that retention policy or that retention schedule. But that should be incorporated into your policy. So your policy should, have, should be a, a retention policy that, that covers documents, Paper documents, electronic documents, and then any statutes and statutory uh, requirements that are, are applicable to your agency, of course, those should also be addressed. And then you want to have this destruction. When are you going to destroy everything? All right. So we were talking about spoliation. And spoliation, this is that uh, key word that I mentioned earlier. It's the destruction or significant alteration of evidence or the failure to preserve evidence in pending or reasonably foreseeable litigation. So even if you have a sense, I mean, um, I mean, your spider senses could be tingling, but that may not be enough to trigger a litigation hold. But if, you, if it's foreseeable, if, if somebody on your staff um, huffs out in a tizzy and I'll get you for this, and it's like, ooh, and this sounds like litigation, then you know. But so. Yeah, and the triggers for, um, for the duty to preserve, it could be statutory, it could, there could be a court order, it could be um, that litigation was reasonably foreseeable, you know, there's this huge accident, and um, there are cases that talk about that. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to go into all of the, um, the cases because this is a really short presentation, but also um, there are a lot of lo uh, non-lawyers who might not really care about the case law, <laughs> so figure. we don't want to... Um, you know, burden you with a bunch of cases that are, don't really um, interest you. But there are guidelines there. For, so for the lawyers in the room, you know, it's easy to find those triggers. And then what can happen if you don't preserve the information that you're supposed to? You can be subject to monetary sanctions, evidentiary sanctions, uh, terminating sanctions, or issue sanctions, which um, will preclude you from litigating specifics um, on a certain issue. We're down to about 10 minutes. Okay. So what has to be preserved? Well, what you have to preserve as opposed to produce, we're just talking about preserving information, what you have to preserve is not diminished by the difficulty of preservation. So if, you, if it costs you money to, more money to pre preserve something, that doesn't mean you don't have to do it. So if you remember, um, we were talking about the accessibility argument, um, whether or not something is readily accessible just has no bearing on whether or not you need to preserve it. And that means for IT, so you might have stuff on backup tapes that you, you, got, you and your attorney have said, oh yeah, this is too hard to, to deal with, so we're going to go ahead and um, we'll try to prove this is too burdensome. You have a strategy, but you still have to keep the tapes just in case. So that's preservation. Right. And a lot of times I will get calls from um, attorneys and they'll say, well, it's just too, this is too burdensome because there's so much of it. Well, so much of something doesn't make it burdensome. It could be so much email, so much, you know, documents on the server, or it could be whatever it is that they're referring to that's so much, but it's easy to access. It simply is going to cost them a lot of money to produce it. So in that situation, you have a lot of something, it's not... The, the argument isn't really this readily accessible argument. The argument is that it's too burdensome to produce it. So you're going to want to recognize that distinction and say, yeah, it's still accessible, but there's four terabytes of data here, and you know, it's just too much for us to look at. So we should think about targeting that in some way, either by a date or by narrowing the number of users that you have to collect information from or narrowing the issues 
or facilities, things like that. So when you have this too much, when you're in a situation where there's just too much as opposed to inaccessible, then you want to think about looking at ways to narrow. And that is in with conjunction with opposing counsel. You can't just arbitrarily decide which custodians you're going to produce and what date range. Right. So you want to have a discussion about it. But um, if you have a, if you're going forward with a good faith argument about why certain things make sense and why, you know, Charles has nothing that is relevant to this issue or anything in your litigation, you don't need his emails. But I, on the other hand, might have a lot of information that's relevant and, and um, responsive. So yes, this person is, is a correct custodian and these people aren't. So you just have to go forward and, and show why. Um, retention policies uh, under the, the, safe, the shallow safe harbor, as long as you have a reasonable document retention policy, it's going to be upheld. If you have a poor policy or one that's never administered, then you're not going to uh, bode very well in terms of the shallow safe harbor. Now, inadvertent disclosure, um, when you have so much electronically stored information, because as I was saying earlier, no one throws anything away. It stays all on their computer. They can't see it out of sight, out of mind. So there's a lot of stuff that they could possibly have to produce. And when you are reviewing four terabytes of information, it takes a long time to do that. Um, we went through in, in one of our class actions, we had to produce information and we had to go to the court and say, here's how much we've looked at, here's how many attorneys, here's the time it took and, and all of that. And it was staggering how slow the review process actually is. But along with that is the possibility that if you have large volumes of information, you're going to inadvertently produce something that is privileged. So what do you do when that happens? Well, first of all, you want to make sure that there is an agreement regarding this possibility. So you want to have a discussion with your lawyers and you say, we have, you know, two terabytes of information. Um, what do we do if something slips through the cracks during the review process? So the lawyers can work out an agreement with the other side about inadvertent disclosure. And you want to get it codified in a court order. You want to talk about it in advance because, trust me, it's going to happen if you have large cases. But then when it does, it doesn't matter because you've already dealt with it. Now, even if you don't have an agreement, the federal rules talk about what you can do, and that's 502. And it adopts this uh, middle-of-the-road reasonableness approach that existed in case law before the rule was amended. And so in that situation, as it shows up here on the screen, you're going to look at the reasonableness of the precautions taken by the per person who is producing, the volume of the discovery, the length of time taken by the producing party to rectify the disclosure, how long did it take for you to find out and do something about it? And then they're going to look at fairness. So if you know you have an inadvertent disclosure, you don't want to wait six months to demand it back from the other side. You want to figure out what happened, send a letter right away, and ask for that back. Demand it back, in fact. Um, so this is just something that is something you should consider when you're producing um, large volumes of electronic information. So litigation holds and um, retention policies. A litigation hold is when you notify, um, that's internal, right, as opposed to a? Yes. So your staff counsel comes to you and says, you, you, and you have been named in a suit. You must retain all of your data pertaining to this, this, and this from this time range to this time range. So you have been told. As a custodian, you must hold on to your data. Do not destroy anything relating to this stuff. That's a litigation hold. And when you as the IT person are notified by your legal staff that a litigation hold has been placed, you must act quickly because of retention policies um, and the fact that people do delete stuff occasionally. You must, on the IT side, make sure that you are putting a stop to any destruction of pertinent um, information for um, production. And here's a fact. People are going to delete even when you tell them not to. So um, in some certain situations, you might have to circumvent their ability to delete, make them store things on the server or um, whatever. We've had ways to hold people accountable. You know, there's 
spot checking. People will go back and make sure if compliance with the litigation hold is actually taking place. But um, you should just expect that there are people who are not going to want to do what you're asking in that, you know, you're supposed to be saving everything. You still have this stuff in the trash. Why is that? You know, oh, I forgot or whatever. So you just have to realize and recognize that you might deal with, need to deal with that. And again, IT and legal system, or the legal staff have formed a communication and they both understand um, what the implications are and it, it can touch the email systems, file servers, PCs, PDAs. So you, you guys are, uh, legal and IT are talking about how to handle all this stuff and you're ready for anything. Um, policies, just you need to know what your backup policy is. As, as I was mentioning back here to this lady in the back, what is um, your backup policy? What's your retention policy? The destruction policy, make sure that you have one of those so that you're not looking at a bunch of uh, electronic information. Um, is your organization capable of litigation holds? What do they do when the lawyer says that you need to implement a litigation hold? And how does that work? Is that process defensible in court? Can you go and stand there and, and present to the court the process for, that takes place when you get a litigation hold? Can you go and defend that? What do you do? And why stuff is available or not available for production and review? No, Your Honor, we don't have stuff going back that far because we have a retention policy that we are following. Here it is. Here it is outlined. That is defendable in court. Um, also, you need to look at whether or not your organization lets people use um, thumb drives, whether they can work from home, maintain personal archives, and if they have a personal cell phone that is used, that they're using to access their work email, what do you do about that? So you need to think about all of those things. Okay, okay uh, voicemail is the, um, the scariest thing. We have never dealt with voicemail demand, so I have never personally gone through it. You mean the AG's office? The AG's office, thank you. We've, okay. To the best of my knowledge, we have never had to deal with um, a discovery demand involving voicemail. It's sort of that um, place where both sides fear to, fear to tread, but you do need to know on both sides that it is discoverable. If opposing counsel demands it, you're obligated to produce it, and so have an idea of what you need to do. Do you contact your phone provider? Do you contact a vendor? So just be prepared in case, so have a plan. Many state agencies are going to, and companies are going to the voiceover internet protocol, which is basically they're just saving a digital uh, copy of the message. And so it's pretty easy to get voicemail. Um, I did have a case, uh, class action, about 10 years ago in which they had asked for voicemail from my client agency, and they didn't know how to do it. And so I said, well, you have to preserve voicemail messages. And it was saved right to their phone. They weren't sure how they'd pres you know, go and get this stuff from 100 users. So they said, everybody just stop sending, just stop sending, leaving voicemail messages. And that was their solution because they didn't know how to do it. So, um, you know, that was something, now it's easier. And can you imagine not leaving voicemail messages on any phone for, you know, after, you know, of course that fell apart after about a week, everyone just kept leaving voicemail messages and they never preserved, contrary to their lawyer's <laughs> advice. <laughs> so voicemail is something that is important and you need to look at just like text messages. All right. <coughs> So um, this, uh, we'll talk about, we've been talking about re record retention policies. What should yours look like? This is actually a picture of the National Archives um, before everything was digital. And it's only, of course, one room that's falling apart. But that's probably, I venture to say, that's how many of your uh, client agencies' um, storage areas look. There's just so much information that then you look at it and you're like, how are we going to go through all of that? So here's a strategy for what you can do. So before the wave hits, you want to make sure that your organization has a document retention policy. You want to make sure that there is a good working relationship between legal, executive management, IT staff, um, your records manager, whoever is responsible for records management, because there, there probably is somebody in the company, you just don't know who they are. Um, it's more likely that, they just, you, that you don't have a working relationship with them. And then also litigation counsel. Um, and then you'll need to understand the system and the vernacular, which we've been talking about, the storage media, devices, locations, and think about those things. So a litigation hold, um, there are really great examples of litigation holds. The Sedona Conference, it's thesedonaconference.org. 
and that's available online, and they have a lot of great references um, for IT staff and lawyers to use when developing specific policies regarding um, whether it's email, looking for a vendor for e-discovery, or litigation holds. So you want to have a written policy. Um, you want it to be short and something that everyone can understand. You want to be able to um, look at that policy and say, oh, here's what I have to do. You don't want it to be 50 pages so convoluted that nobody can understand it. Um, it has to define the responsibilities of each person, who's responsible for what in the process, and then the steps that you take to implement the litigation hold. And then, as I mentioned, you want to follow up and make sure that everyone is actually complying with the litigation hold. Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? All right. So, quickly, the six steps for managing. And this is a very quick gloss over. When you get hit with a discovery request for e-discovery, these are the six steps you're going to follow. Um, you're going to identify the sources, determine the extent of preservation. You're going to collect, filter, review, and produce. And this sounds very quick and easy, but each step is a very long process and, and, and requires a lot of thinking and planning. And the, the most comprehensive one is the review for privilege. So once you get everything, you have to look to see what's responsive and what's not, and then how much of this is privileged. And that's the most expensive and the most time-consuming piece of it. So that's why it's so important, and we keep saying, like I said, IT day. Um, you want to work closely with your IT staff, you know, have the lawyers and IT talking and working together so that this process works smoothly because you don't have a lot of time once a lawsuit is initiated to start doing what you need to do. One of the things that's not on here, and I'm going to mention it really quickly, is called data mapping. It's a concept that, that we've been advising agencies to undertake and data mapping is where you right now, whether you're the lawyer for the agency or your IT staff, you want to determine who does what, who is in what box, and put that person's name in. But then as that changes, you, just, you can change the person's name. But whoever is responsible for a certain task, say that I need to collect email um, from the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I need their email from a certain person. I need to know who to go to, and I need that information quickly. So that goes into that box. And then if that person leaves, it doesn't matter. I know what the title is, and, and then I can substitute the new name. And so you want to have that information about who handles the major systems and who's responsible for over, overall IT, um, you know, who's responsible for implementing the litigation hold, which lawyer, and then who does the lawyer tell to start preservation. That's called data mapping. There's a lot of information about data mapping available online. I'd love to spend more time about, uh, talking about it, but we don't have it, so um, there you go. But that's a concept that you should all be thinking about and be aware of as well. So we're going to stop and take um, a little, take some questions. But before we do that, um, takeaways today, and we've been saying this, is one of them is the federal rules of, of evidence are really important uh, regarding electronic information these days. So whether you're a lawyer or whether you're IT, it's going to impact how you do your job. And then also, everyone needs to work together. So if you have IT staff and they're speaking a language that the lawyers don't understand, everyone needs to come together and figure out how they can communicate because most likely you're going to have to provide that information to the court with respect to discovery. And then, as Charles mentioned, AB5 is the state counterpart of the federal rules, which discusses discovery, um, e-discovery for the state of California. Want to talk about some resources? And resources, as we mentioned before, the Sedona Conference is a great resource. A lot of time and energy went into the Sedona Conference guidelines. It's huge, and it's invaluable. I highly recommend that you, you take a look at that. And vendors. There's a lot of uh, e-discovery vendors like Fios and Kroll on Track. Um, their websites provide free resource um, centers on their internet, um, on their sites, and they're a great resource as well. Yeah, and, and in terms of the Sedona Conference, here's just some of the things that they have. They have a commentary on preservation management and identification of sources of information that are not reasonably, reasonably accessible. So if that's your situation, you can find that. They have what's called a jumpstart outline, and that helps you prepare, prepare for a meet and confer, that type of information. Email management, legal holds, the trigger and the process, and then selection of vendors if you need help with that. So.
So, yes, the gentleman right here. Yeah, so that's a difficult process because some agencies, do you work for a state agency? Yes. Yeah, some state agencies are sued all the time on various subjects. So how can you stop a litigation hold in one area and go, go start one in another? Or if you think something might be responsive to both, what do you do? That is a, there's no, I can't generalize about that. I can't say that, you know, 30 days after the lawsuit, or, or discovery ends, then you can stop the litigation hold. That is a discussion that you need to have with your counsel. And your lawyer should be able to address that with you. And my information is available out here somewhere. If you want to have a discussion with your lawyer and me, and I'm, we're happy to do that. The AG's office represents state agencies. Um, but that is something that you can't generalize. You need to figure out specifically in each case, can the litigation hold be lifted? Mm -hmm. So you started, um, so there's never been any litigation issue. Well, in those situations then, I would look at, you know, what is the threat to the organization at that point in time? And if there's no longer the threat, um, because the big issue has to do with the spoliation sanctions, of course. And in cases, 84% of sanctions are for spoliation, and the rest is for delay in production. So spoliation is huge. So in those situations, you're going to have to look at the threat that faces the organization. So instead of there being a timeline, like there's no discovery or discovery's ended, you have to look at the threat. And, and again, you'll have to work with your lawyers to evaluate whether or not there's still a threat. Yes? Um, regarding home computers. Home computers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that a source of evidence, or how does the litigation hold or uh, retention policy apply? That is a very good question. He asked if for home computers, how do, do they have a retention policy or how does a retention policy apply to them? Um, your organization should have a policy regarding use or working on a home computer because your expectation of privacy in your home computer, um, depending on the amount of work that, you do, that they do on it, will decrease as the use increases. And the same with a cell phone. Um, a personal cell phone that they're accessing their email. Their expectation of privacy is what determines um, the, the requirements for production of evidence from that device. So there are a bunch of criminal cases, cases dealing with, um, in the criminal context, with production of information from home computers. It's less prevalent in civil cases, but if you have an employee that is working from home, you need to have a policy that governs that. And so that's going to be the policy that applies as opposed to uh, some general rule or case law. You have to look at it in your case. And we are out of time. I'm getting the, the thumbs up in the back. So um, thank you. And if you have any questions, we'll be available to answer them.